The psalmist says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. We're going to begin by singing a hymn that uh, reminds us of God's greatness, number 190, 190. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made. Number 190.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray together. How great thou art. O oh Lord, we do sing these words with great gladness in our hearts and with true and with heartfelt praise. For we know that you are the great God, the great one, great in power, great in awesome wonder. As we've sung about, you are the creator of all the earth, the beauty of all this world with all its infinite complexity, its infinite grandeur that we see and contemplate, that we study in our sciences, that we express in the language of the arts, the greatness that thrills our human hearts and our minds and that gives our earthly lives the richness and the variety and the opportunity that is truly extraordinary. And yet, Lord, as we've also sung, for us who know you and love you, greater by far is the greatness that you've revealed to us by being not only our creator but our redeemer, sending your own Son, the Beloved One, and sending him into the brokenness of our human and sinful existence to rescue us to make us new, to bring us into your own family, to bear away the burdens of our sin, and to set us free forever in your love, so that when indeed Christ shall come again to declare his kingdom complete and perfected, on that day, our hearts will surely overflow with joy and with gladness, and will do so forever and ever in your everlasting presence. Indeed, Lord, how great thou art, and how kind thou art, kind and merciful and gracious and so condescending in your love to us that you should stoop so low to lift frail, sinful creatures such as ourselves, to lift us so high that we also might share in the crown of life. So help us, Lord, we pray to love you as we ought in response to your great grace and your greatness. Help us to honor you as we ought, not only on our lips in song and in prayer as we gather together this morning, but in our lives as day by day we go out into this world bearing the name of Christ and bearing the message of his glorious kingdom. Help us to be, we pray, O Lord, a people who turn the eyes and the hearts of our loved ones and our friends to the awesome wonder of our great God. So, Lord, this is our morning prayer, and we ask that as we draw near to you this morning, so also you would draw near to us to reassure our hearts and our minds of your great mercy and love, that we might be sent on our way to be better servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. For it's in his name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, uh, everyone, to our service here this morning. And a very special welcome to the uh, family and friends of John and Manon McInarlin, because they are here sharing with us this morning in the baptism of little Aaron. And uh, in a moment... Uh, I'm going to baptize Aaron, but as always, when we uh, have a baptism, we like to explain it, exactly what it is that we're doing and uh, why we're doing it. Some of you may not be familiar uh, with this whole business of baptism, and it's important that we're not just doing things that we don't know anything about. So let me uh, explain. Listen to the words of 
the institution of this sacrament of baptism as they were delivered by the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples after he had risen from the dead and before he ascended to the glory of his Father. Jesus said this, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. You go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, the prophets of old had foretold a day when God would do a new thing in the earth through his Messiah, no longer just chiefly among the Jews, but among people of every tribe and tongue and nation, a people who would be cleansed truly and renewed by the grace in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Prophet Ezekiel put it this way, I will sprinkle clean water on you in that day and you shall be clean. And I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That was the promise. The prophet Joel likewise said, in that day I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And the sacrament of baptism thus instituted is a sign and a seal of God's covenant grace for this new age. It speaks of fulfillment. Fulfillment once and for all of all the repetitive washings and sprinklings that took place in the Old Testament times to signify the washing away of sins. It speaks of our engrafting into Christ through the once and for all forgiveness by his shed blood for our sins. It speaks of regeneration by the once and for all pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon God's people forever. And therefore it preaches to us the message at last of true adoption, the promise of resurrection to eternal life as God's children. Now, although little children like Aaron don't understand these things yet, the promise is nevertheless also to them. Because children born to believing parents have by their birth an interest in God's covenant of grace, in his gospel. They're heirs of that grace. They're set apart as holy even when they're born, says Paul to the church in Corinth. And therefore, they too are entitled to the sign and the seal of that covenant grace, which in our age is baptism. And in this sacrament that we take part in this morning, we are listening to God, as it were, say once again, let the little children come to me, for as such is the kingdom of heaven. And so this act of covenant baptism, baptizing a helpless infant who does not yet understand, it's a standing witness, when you think about it, to the priority of grace over faith in the Christian life. In baptizing a little child, we're declaring to the world the true gospel. We're saying that what God does for us, he does without our merit. He does without even our knowledge. In baptism, really, perhaps more plainly than anywhere else, we see that God commends his love towards us in that while we were still without strength, as Paul says, Christ died for us. So, the gospel word of grace comes to us freely, without waiting for a prior response on our part. And yet, of course, the gospel word never comes to any without also calling for a response, a real response, which is the obedience of faith. And so that means that this word of baptism that we proclaim in action this morning isn't something we can treat lightly, not at all. It's something that calls for real faith. It's something that calls for real trusting response. First of all, of course, from the parents, John and Manon, as in faith and trust 
they bring their little one to God. But of course also, in due course, from little Aaron himself. As he grows into faith and understanding, and into the obedience of following his Lord. The truth is that God has promised great and gracious things to us as Christian parents. If it were not so, who would dare to bring a new life into the world? We must take God seriously then at his word and show that trust and show that faith, bringing up our children in faith, not in fear, but resolutely determining that from the beginning we claim these little ones for the service of the Lord and we teach them the obedience that his apostles have taught us. And that's why the Bible commands us not to let our children go their own way, but to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, John and Manon, would you like to stand? It's the duty of all parents who bring their children for baptism then to confess that faith into which they're to be baptized and to promise before Almighty God to bring them up in that nurture and admonition of the Lord. So John and Manon, and especially to you, John, as the father, as under God, the head of this household of faith, Aaron depends chiefly on you both for all the help and the encouragement that he needs. So in presenting him for baptism, do you confess, both of you, your faith in God as your heavenly father and in Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord and in the Holy Spirit as your sanctifier? And do you promise then, depending on God's grace, to teach Aaron the truths and the duties of Christian faith, and by prayer and precept and example, to bring him up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Well, of course, we all who are gathered here as the household of faith, we also bear responsibilities under God for this family. We are called to stand with John and Manon, to help them and not hinder them, to encourage them, and to do all that we can in our mutual commitment to them as parents and to their family, that they too might be helped by the fellowship. So I'm going to ask the congregation to stand as John and Manon come up here before you, because we want to stand in solidarity with them as they take these solemn vows before the Lord. There's just enough room for us all up here. And isn't this a magnificent kilt that Aaron's wearing? Well, Aaron, your parents claim for you both the privileges but also the responsibilities of belonging to those who name the name of Christ. And so, therefore, Aaron... John, Mac and Arlen, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and dwell in your heart forever. Aaron, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Friends, according to Christ's commandment, Aaron is now received into the fold and the family of this church, engaged, as it were, to in due course confess his faith in Jesus Christ. And we trust to grow up, to be his servant all the days of his life, and therefore I commend him and his parents into the love and the prayers of our fellowship here. And I encourage you, along with John and Manon, to discharge the duties of your faith as together we seek to bring up all of our little ones in the nurture and the admonition of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we stand, let's pray together. Lord God, of these great and gracious covenant promises in Christ, grant all of us, we pray this morning, the faith 
to be true to all that has been promised. We pray for this precious family who in this year have known the sadness of bereavement and loss even at the very time of the joy of new birth in the gift of Aaron. Would you this day encourage their hearts and bless them and enable them, Lord, so to appropriate with gladness and joy all that is done today that this little one, being marked out as yours, will indeed in due time come to confess freely his own faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and be not only his servant and his soldier all the way until his life's end. So hear us and grant us this our prayer for we ask it trusting in the promises of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. As we stand then, let's sing together our baptismal hymn number 933. Our children, Lord, in faith and prayer, we bring before your face. Okay, you can... I've got words here. Okay. to do please be seated and um, just to say that if there are any with uh, uh, little children under seven who uh, are here today and don't know we have summer Sunday schools for them and uh, any time now uh, you're able to uh, take them out uh, and they'll be looked after during the later part of the service. Let me uh, welcome you once again to our fellowship this morning very especially if you're visiting with us perhaps you're on holiday as uh, Uh, No doubt many of our own folks still are, and uh, if you're here visiting with us on holiday, you're very welcome indeed. If you've just come, I'm afraid it looks like you've missed the summer, but never mind, you'll get a very warm welcome in Glasgow all the same. Can I uh, just mention one or two notices? We don't have a notice sheet uh, during these summer weeks, but there are one or two things just to note for you. Uh, for your knowledge and for prayers. This coming week, tu- uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we have our uh, boys' uh, football club meeting for boys aged 7 to 18. 
at 10 o'clock till 12 at the Scottsdale Leisure Center. Terry McCutcheon is leading that. If you want to know more about that, if you have friends, boys that you'd like to invite, then uh, speak to Terry for more information. And do be praying for that. It's an opportunity that we have uh, to reach out and to share the gospel with uh, many young boys. Uh, then also uh, lun lunchtime talk on Wednesday as usual. Do pray for Terry, who will be coming fresh from his football to uh, lead us. I hope he'll change first uh, <laughs> in uh, the study on Colossians. But whether he's in his football strip or not uh, remains to be seen. But Wednesday as usual at 1.15. Then on Thursday evening at Tyndale Box, that's our uh, summer cafe for students and young workers. For those who are uh, around during the summer or have just come back uh, with early classes, do come along uh, on Thursday evening here uh, at 7.30, and you'll be made very welcome. Next Sunday, we have our early communion service at 10, uh, the morning service at 11, and uh, that will be the last morning service that uh, David and Julie Robry and the family are going to be with us. They return to Nigeria on the 8th of August, and uh, so John Taylor, uh, our missionary team leader, will be praying uh, to recommission them next Sunday. I'm sure they would very much value your prayers as they pack their 13 suitcases, and uh, goodness knows what else to try and get on the plane uh, a week on Thursday. Do be praying for them as they make these uh, arrangements. I'm to be away for the uh, month of August on a brief sabbatical. Next Sunday, uh, Andy Gemmel will be preaching in the morning and Bob in the evening. Uh, I will be preaching next Sunday, but in Aberdeen at uh, Trinity Church, and I value your prayers for our fellowship there uh, with Peter Dixon and David Gibson and the fellowship there that we have so many links with. Also for this evening, where I'm preaching in Perth at uh, Knox Free Church uh, with Paul Gibson, uh, another brother that we have had uh, much to do with over the last year or so, and uh, uh, in very much in partnership with him and that congregation. I'll bring them your greetings, uh, as I will to Aberdeen, and I'm sure uh, they will be glad to know that we pray for them. There are a number of uh, SU camps uh, still going on and about to begin next Saturday. Uh, a vast number of uh, you folks here will be leading on a camp beginning at Lendrick Muir and uh, uh, under Mark Campbell's leadership and uh, also a number will be going off to Aaron, I think, uh, to King's Cross, including Bob and uh, the Porter family and quite a few of our youngsters. So do pray for them especially. Do pray that... Uh, the weather forecast might take a turnabout again, and uh, we'll return to good camp weather. Also, uh, this coming week, uh, there's a, uh, a summer Bible week called Contagious, which uh, began last year and uh, will be continuing this year. Agnes is on the team for that. Kirsty McCauley is going to be going along to that in Strathallan School, a week-long uh, Bible training camp, and uh, uh, they would very much value your prayers too. But many, many other things still going on over the summer months. Do let's continue to pray for all of those involved and for the many opportunities for the gospel that these events uh, afford. Well, we're going to turn now to our Bible reading for this morning, and uh, we're back in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians at chapter 10. If you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, I think that's page 968, page 968, and uh, we're going to read again the whole of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, although Edward today is looking at the second part of, uh, of this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 at verse 1. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I'm away. I beg of you. When I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For although we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. We take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. 
For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you with my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent, we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. But we do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it's not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Amen. And may God bless to us this his word. Well, we're going to uh, have a pause now as the musicians play and our offerings for the Lord's work are received. You might like to use the time to pray quietly for those in need or perhaps to ponder again these words that we'll be studying together shortly. But as the musicians play, our offerings will be received. Pray together. 
Heavenly Father, we're glad to bow before you in whose hands this whole world and all its affairs and concerns are held with complete power, utter sovereignty, and certain outcome. What a comfort it is, Lord, to remember these things as we look at a world that seems to be shifting and changing, full of uncertainties, and constantly bringing fear and anxiety. We read our newspapers and sometimes feel overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of all that we read, things going on in our world that would seem to be shaking the whole of human society to the core. How easy it is for us to forget, O oh God, that you alone are Lord. That when we see strife on the streets in Egypt and army helicopters flying above the streets where millions of protesters fight, when we see pictures of dreadful civil war in Syria, when we see signs of starvation because of natural calamity, or more usually, the dreadful infliction of oppression upon a people by wanton cruelty or governments. All of these things, O oh Lord, can overwhelm us, and yet your word reminds us that these things are not because of a failing in God, but because of a willful rebelliousness in the heart of man that has brought such curse upon the beauty of this earth. But your word turns us above, O oh God, to see not only the symptoms of that rebellion upon the face of our planet and in our own society, in our own world, in our own lives. Your word lifts us above to the serene picture of he who sits upon the throne and in whose hands gathers all of time and eternity and is shaping it according to his perfect plan. And so we thank you, Lord, that although we face so much rank evil in this world, your word does not try to pretend it away, but meets it head on and teaches us that the only answer to such evil is in a divine dealing with sin and with the consequences of the rebellion of man through the wondrous self-giving death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore the only answer to the longings, the needs, the fears, the hopes of the men and women and the boys and girls of this world is to be taught the message of our Lord Jesus Christ, his call of grace, his gift of eternal life. So we pray, Lord, for every opportunity that is afforded to your church in all the world, but very especially, Lord, thinking of ourselves and all the opportunities that you give to us and that you indeed call us to as a people, naming your name. We thank you, Father, for the very particular opportunities the summer does bring. We lay before you these camps that will begin in these next few days. We thank you for the 30 or so young folk, teenagers from many churches who will go to Contagious beginning tomorrow for a week of clear Bible teaching, of instruction in your word and of encouragement in the faith. We pray, Lord, that everyone who goes to participate in that will be thus strengthened, their minds opened, and their hearts touched also with a desire to serve you and to love you more. We pray that the fruit of this week might be seen in the years to come in the colleges and universities of our nation, that some of these young folk may go on to become leaders in university and college Christian unions, evangelists, and those who will share the good news of Christ with others then and throughout the rest of their lives. 
We think of our own camp beginning at Lendrick Muir under Mark and Katie and so many of our congregation here going to lead. We pray for all the young ones who will come to that, some from very difficult backgrounds, some having never heard anything of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ before. We pray the same, Lord, for those who go to Aaron under Kenny's leadership. We pray too, Lord, for both of these camps, that the young folk would hear the message of Christ, be captivated by the beauty of Christ, and sense the fragrance of Christ emanating from the leaders, those who are giving of their time and energies to share the good news of Jesus with them. May all that they see and hear and feel and experience speak of the beauty of our Lord Jesus and the glory of his kingdom. We pray, Lord, for Rona Saunders, also leaving tomorrow for Rwanda, to serve in an orphanage there for the coming weeks. And we ask the same for her, Lord, that you would go with her and travel and grant her the opportunities to share the love of the Lord Jesus Christ with so many who have so little, and yet for whom your love is as great and abounding as for the greatest in this world. We pray, Lord, for our ongoing regular opportunities here in Glasgow through our Wednesday lunchtime service, and pray for Terry as he preaches on, some, uh, on Wednesday, that you would give him just the right words to speak the word of Christ to all who are here. We pray for the opportunities with the lads on the football pitch and afterwards. We pray for every conversation that we're able to have out in the streets as we invite people to our services week by week on Sundays and on Wednesdays. We pray, Lord, for every friendship that each of us may have with others in our offices or schools or college or wherever it is that we work in our neighborhood with our friends. Every opportunity that you give us to speak a word for the Lord Jesus Christ in season, to give a reason for the hope that is within us, Help us, Lord, we pray, to be those whose lives are like an open book, but a book that speaks the beautiful and the wonderful words of life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, who is sufficient for these things? As we look at our own lives, as we sense our weakness, our inadequacy, it's so easy for us to be in despair we make so many mistakes. We fall so many times. We disappoint ourselves day by day and week by week, never mind our brothers and sisters, far less your own glory. But you have chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise, and you have purposed to show the magnitude of your glorious power even through the feebleness of these frail jars of clay. So help us, we pray. Help us in knowing the boundlessness of your love to us, which no thought can reach, no tongue can declare. Help us to have thankful hearts, willing to turn again and again and again in penitence and in trust to you. Help us to be those who can truly say that we are wholly yours, all that we are and all that we have, that you might be the constant flame even amid the darkness of our lives, that we might have something, something for you, that in this week, that lies ahead, there may be even one thing, one time, one word that we might speak worthily for our Savior. So hear us, gracious Heavenly Father, and come to us now as we seek you in your word. Fill us afresh, we pray, by your Holy Spirit, and send us out to make Jesus Christ known. 
for we ask it in his name. Amen. Before Edward comes then to speak to us, we're going to sing once more hymn number 844. Number 844, Jesus, your boundless love to me, no thought can reach, nor tongue declare. Oh, take my thankful heart and be the only Lord and Master there. Number 844. morning, friends. Let's turn together to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, to the passage that was read earlier, <clears throat> page 968, 969, in our big hardback Bibles. For those of you who are visitors, perhaps strangers to us, we always like to open up the Bible because the preacher's task is not so much to, to bring his own thoughts and opinions out into the open because they, I guess, wouldn't be worth too much, but rather to, to concentrate on a Bible passage and to seek to bring out its meaning and the, the implications of it. So that's why we ask you to turn up the passage. Now, my title for this morning is True and Counterfeit Gospel Work. And the passage we're looking at is particularly chapter 10, verses 7 to 18. Paul's, the Apostle Paul's central purpose in writing this second letter to the Corinthians is to educate the Corinthian Christians to distinguish true gospel work from its counterfeit. And this purpose really comes to its head 
It runs right the way through the epistle, but it comes to its head in the final four chapters. And you may remember that Paul was writing this letter from Macedonia, up in northern Greece, a long way from Corinth. But he knew that a group of influential people had come into the church at Corinth from outside, and Paul knew that these people, strong and influential, had an agenda which was not the agenda of the true gospel. And they were calling themselves not only Christians, but apostles of Christ. If you look across to chapter 11, verse 13, you'll see just how Paul understands them and characterizes them. 11, 13, such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And he goes on to say that that's no wonder because even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light, and these people really are his servants. Now, Paul is deeply concerned that these false leaders who've come into Corinth are going to lead the Corinthian Christians astray and ruin the church. Look what he says in chapter 11, verse 2. I feel a divine jealousy for you, for I betrothed you to one husband. Paul pictures himself as a kind of matchmaker. I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone, someone else, comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Why should they put up readily enough with some different gospel? Because they hadn't yet learned to distinguish this different heterodox gospel from the real gospel that they heard from Paul. So Paul is saying you must leave naivety behind and learn to distinguish the true from the false. And our passage from chapter 10 today is all part of Paul's education program for the Corinthians as he helps them to see why these false teachers are false and how their methods of work and leadership are counterfeit. Now, I think we can immediately see how important all this kind of thing is for our churches today. In our own congregation, just think back over the last two or three or four years, we have had to ask some very serious questions about what is true and what is false, and we have had to take some far-reaching and painful, difficult action. But it's not just a question for our church. All churches are confronted with this kind of question in every generation, because the serpent of chapter 11, verse 3, is always at work seeking to deceive congregations and to lead them astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Now, when you first become a Christian, it's easy, and I guess natural and understandable, to assume that all churches are really very much the same. You might think, I'm conscious there are small differences, superficial differences between churches, but surely they're like the differences between a Ford Fiesta and a Fiat Punto. Very slight differences, but the the same basic underlying reality surely is there. But then time goes on, and your knowledge of the Bible grows, and your experience of the Christian life grows as well, and you begin to see that not all churches are coming from the same direction at all. But in fact, there are big differences, some of the differences so big as to be incompatible and irreconcilable. And then you might think, oh dear, dear, I'm beginning to see the wood from the trees here. This is so painful. They can't all be right because these differences run so deep. And yet, wouldn't it be charitable just to bumble along and say that, well, we just hope that everyone's going to get to the right place in the end? I mean, wouldn't it be rather harsh? and judgmental to say that one group have got it right and another have got it wrong? Isn't it rather unloving to draw sharp lines between one position and another? Now, the whole of 2 Corinthians is Paul drawing sharp lines between what is true and what is false, between what is right and what is wrong. And what the Corinthian Christians needed and what every church needs was to grow mature and discerning so as to be able to distinguish the true gospel from its counterfeits and true gospel work from its false imitations. If this church at Corinth were to prove in the end unwilling to distinguish the true from the false, Paul knew that it would be ruined beyond repair. 
And one reason, surely, why many congregations today remain immature and naive is that they're not willing to take responsibility for distinguishing the true from the false. They throw their hands up and say, who are we to say that one way is right and another is wrong? Now, in many parts of the Bible, the distinctions between the true and the false are clear and easy to understand. So just to give one or two examples, it's clear right the way through the Bible that worshipping idols is wrong and worshipping the one true only God is right. It's clear that stealing is wrong and that uh, uh, respecting other people's property is right. It's clear that coveting is wrong and learning to be content with what we have is right. And there are many other issues where the distinctions are equally clear. But here in 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul had a much more difficult task because the true and the false, in this case, were all bound up with personalities. What Paul is laboring to get the Corinthians to recognize is that he, Paul, is the true apostle and true teacher of the gospel, whereas these incomers and their influence are threatening to ruin the church. So as he draws the distinctions between the true gospel and counterfeit gospel work, he is having to compare and contrast himself and his style of work with these false apostles and their way of working. And that, to Paul, is excruciatingly embarrassing because Paul was such a humble and gentle person and he hated having to draw attention to himself. His whole message was, look at Jesus Christ. As he said back in chapter 4, verse 5 of this very letter, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. And yet later in the letter, he's having to make the Corinthians see how false their false apostles are, and he's got to contrast them and their arrogant ways with himself and his true and faithful methods. And it's this sense of embarrassment that lies behind his frequent use of the word boasting in this letter. You may have noticed he used it six times between verse 13 and verse 18 in chapter 10. And it runs on right the way through chapter 11 and chapter 12, which we'll get to in a few weeks' time, this theme of boasting. What Paul actually believes about boasting, he expresses in chapter 10, verse 17. Just have a look with me there, 10, 17, where he's quoting straight from the prophet Jeremiah. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. That is the only appropriate boasting, he's saying, to boast and rejoice and exult and glory in the Lord. But Paul is having to say to his wayward and beloved Corinthians, you're forcing me against my will to turn the spotlight on myself. I don't want to. My boast is in Jesus Christ, but you're forcing me to set forth my credentials and justify my methods, because only by doing so am I going to persuade you that my gospel work is true and trustworthy, and the manner and lifestyle of these false apostles is corrupt. I'm having to commend myself to you. I wish it were not necessary. It makes me feel as if I'm boasting about myself, when the only one I want to boast about is the Savior. But if I don't write like this, all is going to be lost at Corinth. So do you see something of the bind that Paul finds himself in? It's a kind of catch-22 situation. He hates having to commend himself and his work to the Corinthians. And part of the reason why he hates doing it is that these, these false apostles are constantly commending themselves and each other to the Corinthians. We're going to see that in, in a moment from verse 12. Self-commendation is horrible to Paul. Just look at how he writes in verse 18 of our chapter. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, approved by the Lord, but rather the one whom the Lord commends. Now, Paul believes verse 18 and verse 17 with all his heart, and yet he's forced to commend himself to the Corinthians so as to help them to grow up and take responsibility, to help them to distinguish the true from the counterfeit. All right, friends, are you still with me? Is it warm in here? Take a deep breath. I'm just going to take a little, a little draft of Billy Bradford's bellicose brew. There we go. Thank you. All right. Now, with all that by way of introduction, with all that in mind, we're going to look now at verses 7 to 18, where Paul begins to draw this contrast between himself and the false apostles. And the big point that he's making throughout these verses 
is that the false leaders are spoiled and corrupted by their arrogance and their sense of spiritual one-upmanship. In their view, they are vastly superior to Paul, and Paul is vastly inferior to them. Now let's notice how Paul begins. Verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. Now that's quite a gentle beginning, but it's really quite a challenge. Uh, What he's saying is, open your eyes, look around you, look at every aspect of your situation, and begin to draw your conclusions. I guess the modern equivalent would be, wake up and smell the coffee. Have you lost your power of analyzing what is going on in your church? Look at what is before your eyes. Look under your noses. And now Paul helps them to see the smugness and sense of superiority of these corrupt leaders. And we'll notice three particular ways in which he does this. First, in verse 7, he points out that they're claiming to belong to Christ in some special way. So verse 7, if anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. Now the anyone of that verse is obviously one of the false apostles. And this false apostle perhaps all the false apostles, have clearly been claiming that they belong to some kind of elite rank within the Church of Christ. We needn't necessarily think they've been saying that Paul is not a Christian at all, but this verse only makes sense if they've been saying that they are elite Christians, whereas Paul belongs to the plebs of the church. That's why Paul says in verse 7, we too, that is Timothy and I and our companions, we also belong to Christ. So Paul Paul won't allow that there is an elite club of Christians within the church and that everybody else is a kind of second best lot who tag along miles behind. Paul's way is always to honor every person who belongs to Christ. Now certainly Paul teaches in his letters that different Christians have different roles to play, have different gifts and abilities to bring to the life of the church. He recognizes that there are varying levels of maturity and understanding but he will never allow that there are first-class Christians and second-class Christians. Why? Because Paul could never forget that every Christian is a wretched, rebellious sinner rescued only by grace. And that puts us all on exactly the same level. I know we think of the Apostle Paul as a great Christian leader, but think of the way he describes himself. 1 Timothy chapter 1, formerly... I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man who was saved only by grace and mercy. Now, friends, if you and I could truly sing, truthfully sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a worthy and excellent specimen of humanity like me. If we could truthfully sing those words, we might then be able to place ourselves in an elite class in the Christian church. But none of us can sing those words. We're all saved wretches who have been rebels against the loving lordship of Christ. If any of us ever start to think of ourselves as being superior Christians, either because of the length of our Christian service or the quality of our gifts or the keen devotion of our hearts, that we're so much keener and more devoted than that wretch sitting next to us in church, then we need to take ourselves on one side and administer a sharp rebuke to our pride we'd be beginning to become like the false apostles of Corinth, thinking of ourselves like that. The truth is that each of us is a sinner saved by mercy, and that mercy is undeserved. Perhaps we folk in the Tron Church face a particular pitfall at the moment. Having left the Church of Scotland a year or so ago, for very good and thoroughly justifiable reasons, having done that, we might be tempted to think, that we're rather superior Christians, superior to those Bible-believing Christians who are still in the Church of Scotland. But we're not superior. Even the most mature, hard-working Christians in our congregation are at best wretched sinners who have been rescued by undeserved mercy. So there's the first thing. Paul is teaching the Corinthians that the elitism of the false apostles is a damaging attitude. Now, secondly, we'll take verses 8 to 11. In those verses, Paul is 
uh, teaching the Corinthians that the false apostles are very wrong in their attempt to denigrate Paul. Now, this is a similar point to the last one, but it actually goes a step further. It's one thing to claim to belong to an elite group, but these wretched leaders are going much further. They're not simply saying, we are superior. They're also saying, Paul is inferior. I think verses 8 to 11 hang together as a, as a unit of thought. And in these four verses, they're quite difficult verses, but I think Paul is saying this, I'm not inferior. I do have a proper authority given to me by the Lord Jesus himself. Now, let me just try and offer a, a paraphrase, paraphrase of verses 8 to 11 to, to, to bring out the flavor of them. Paul is saying, it may be that I am having to boast of my authority more than I wish, the authority given to me by the Lord. But that authority is a good authority because it has been given to me so as to build you up and not to pull you down. So I'm not ashamed to assert my authority if I have to. My critics, these false leaders, they charge me with being tough when I write letters and I'm at a safe distance, but weak when I'm physically present. But they're wrong, and they'd better understand that my toughness by letter Will be, will be matched by my toughness in person when I come to Corinth and discipline them. Now, these verses show that Paul is being denigrated really in two ways. First of all, there's this charge of inconsistency. He's tough and threatening when he's miles away and safe, uh, but he's weak and, and, he's, and he's a pathetic speaker as well when you actually meet him. So he's an inconsistent leader, and he's not one who is worth following. But that's not the only charge. They're also charging him with being really and truly weak. Let me try and draw a simple parallel. They're really saying that Paul is like the lion who goes to the fancy dress party looking like a lion and roaring like a lion. But underneath, when you take the fancy dress off him, he's just an old tabby cat. He's toothless and clawless. They're saying at the end of verse 10, Paul is a man with no presence and no personal charisma. And when he speaks in public, he is really rather pathetic. So when you read these forceful letters of his, you realize that it's a phony boldness. He's not really bold at all. He's a little man, and therefore he should be disregarded. Now, it doesn't need much imagination on our part to see what kind of effect this drip, drip of criticism against Paul would have done to the congregation at Corinth. A good number of the Corinthians were beginning to move away from Paul and even to despise him. His proper authority and proper role of leadership were being seriously undermined, and the result could only be that the strength and godliness of the church was being eroded. So we have, first of all, elitism, second, a denigration of Paul, and then Paul's third exposure, of, of the falseness of these false apostles begins in verse 12, and that is that they are constantly commending themselves and each other to the Corinthians. Look at verse 12. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. So Paul is saying we, that's Timothy and I, and there's, there's strong irony here. He's saying we wouldn't dare to put ourselves in the same class as these self-commenders. Now, friends, let's try and picture the scene on a Sunday morning at church in Corinth. It's 11 o'clock at Corinth, Sunday morning in 56 AD, and the church has got together for its regular Sunday morning worship, and one of these false leaders stands up to get the meeting going, and he says something like this. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and a warm, warm welcome to you all to our dynamic fellowship. I have a very special treat for you this morning. We all know what blessings have come to our fellowship since, since I became one of your senior leaders here some time ago. Well, sitting over here on my right, we have a man after my own heart, a chip very much off my own block, you might say. Let me introduce to you Baruch, who has come all the way by sea to us from Judea. His reputation, of course, precedes him, so you'll already know what a very wonderful man he is. He's a man of authority and perceptiveness and great personal power. 
And as for his ability as a speaker, what needs to be said? As you know, I've been circulating manuscripts of his recent sermons for some weeks, and you'll be aware of how silver his tongue is. But Baruch has condescended to spend six months with us, preaching and teaching every Sunday and every Wednesday. So our church has a golden future with leadership so unlike that of the bad old days when, well, I won't mention him by name, of course, that would be invidious, would it not? But I refer to the bad old days when somebody else was uh, teaching the congregation. Baruch, let's give him a warm welcome because he comes in the blessing of God, doesn't he? Now, friends, I'm exaggerating, of course. But something rather like that must have been going on at Corinth for Paul to say what he says in verse 12. And isn't that final phrase of verse 12 devastating? When they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are, here's the devastating remark, without understanding. They're behaving foolishly and absurdly. They've lost touch with reality. Friends, I need hardly say, if that kind of thing were ever to creep into our church, I hope you would stamp on it immediately. Now, looking back into the passage, I think this paragraph, uh, the paragraph break, really ought to come before verse 12 rather than after verse 12. In other words, verse 12 really belongs to the final paragraph of the chapter and not to the middle paragraph. I say that because verses 13 to 18 are Paul's reply to verse 12. The section is all about how to measure the worth of somebody's work. So in verse 12, these absurd false apostles are simply measuring the worth of their work by themselves and by each other. They're setting their own kind of standard. They're saying, my work is wonderful, and so is my friend's work, because his work is just like mine, which chips off the same block. But in verse 13, Paul counters by saying, you can't measure the value of a man's work by your own self-created standard. You've got to measure it by an objective external standard. Let me draw a simple parallel. This is the time of year when school pupils are awaiting exam results, aren't they? Imagine two school pupils who have just sat there, their Scottish hires, and imagine one says to the other, we won't send our examination papers off to the examination board. Let's avoid that trap. Let's mark each other's papers. So the two students mark each other's papers, and surprise, surprise, they give each other a grade A. Now, what is that grade A worth? Nothing. Those papers have got to go to the external examination board to be properly judged against an objective standard. Now, that's the situation here in Corinth. These corrupt leaders are measuring each other's work by their own self-grading system. And Paul is saying it's worthless. But, verse 13, if I can again paraphrase, we will not make any claims about our work without proper standards. We will only measure our work against the standard of God's commission to us, which extends to you at Corinth. And what Paul has in mind there is surely his, God's original commission and call to him, which he'd received many years before at his conversion. The Lord Jesus said this about Paul at his conversion. He didn't say it directly to him. He said it to Ananias, who went to, uh, to visit Paul just after he was converted. Here are the Lord Jesus' words. This man, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and the children of Israel. Now, those words would have been burned into Paul's heart. They shaped the rest of his life. He knew that the Lord Jesus had called him and commissioned him to take the gospel to the Gentiles as well as to the Jews. So when he came to Corinth, a great Gentile city, and he planted a church there, he knew that he was working within the terms of his commission, and therefore his work was in line with the measure or standard that God had given him. God had assigned him an area of influence, as he puts it in verse 13. And that is why, verse 14, he was not overextending himself or going beyond his proper limits. And then you'll see in both verse 15 and verse 16, he's saying that it would be improper for him to point to success in his work if he was just piggybacking on the success of others. That's what the false apostles are doing. They were muscling in on Paul's work and trying to take it over and, and, and claim huge credit for it, even though actually they're destroying it. 
what Paul has been building up, they're doing their best to pull down. And they're awarding themselves grade A's and diplomas of merit in the process. That attitude, says Paul, is completely illegitimate. Commending yourself is off limits. The one who is truly approved, verse 18, is not the one who commends himself like these charlatans, but the one who, like Paul, is commended by the Lord. Now, what this is going to mean for people like us is that we can't devise our own standards of gospel work. These false leaders at Corinth were doing their own thing in their own way, and it wasn't God's way. Paul, on the other hand, as he puts it in verse 13, only tackles the task that the Lord God has assigned him. So how do we learn in our generation to do God's work in God's way? By studying God's manual, the training manual, which is the Bible. It's the Bible that teaches us both what the gospel is, but also how to do gospel work, how to to teach the gospel and spread it and build up churches. Everything we need to know about gospel work and its counterfeits is laid out for us in the pages of Scripture. And our main teachers here are the Lord Jesus himself, the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the apostles, and particularly Paul, because he did so much gospel work that is recorded for us and analyzed for us in the New Testament. So the evangelistically-minded church studies evangelism in the Bible. That's not to say that we should never read good Christian books on evangelism and mission. The best ones can be very helpful if they're taking the Bible's teaching and unpacking it and explaining it for us. But it's always the Bible that trains us because the Bible is God's own teaching to us. So these three things, elitism, denigration of Paul, self-commendation. Do we have such things in the churches today? Of course we have these dangers, and any church can fall into any of these traps. Elitism is always just round the corner because the human heart is naturally proud and always wants to elevate itself above other people and to say our group is superior to yours. So that's one danger. Denigration of Paul. (laughs) That has been a frequent pastime of theological writers and of ordinary congregations. But we can be sure of this, that a congregation's attitude to Paul will always be a litmus test of its attitude to Christ. And self-commendation, that will come to us as naturally as breathing. We can't guard too carefully against it. Well, Father Time is looking at his watch and preparing to take the bales off the stumps. But before he does, let me just very briefly suggest three things now for us to think about. First, the maturing congregation and the maturing Christian become unafraid to assess the value of the gospel work that we are involved in. Paul says here in verse 7, look at what is before your eyes. Open your eyes. Think carefully about what you see and draw your conclusions. Throughout this second letter to the Corinthians, Paul is training the Corinthians to evaluate the work of their church. He's teaching them how to distinguish the true and good from the false and destructive. And we too, as we grow up, need to train ourselves to look at situations analytically and to discern what is really going on. Secondly, let's not be surprised when good Christian leadership is denigrated. Think of Paul. He was heartily loved by many people, but he was heartily despised and mistrusted by many others. It's always going to be like that for wise and persevering Christian leaders, because the gospel they teach and represent so deeply challenges the standards of the world. And it's not only our Christian leaders who will be denigrated. Any Christian who stands firm on the gospel and on gospel ethics will be treated with scorn and suspicion. But friends, we're in good company. It happened to everybody in the Bible who was a servant of the Lord. And it's a great comfort to us to know that Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you, because that's how they treated the false prophets. False prophets will always be praised for what they say because it will be in tune with the world's agenda. But Paul and those who follow him and follow Christ can expect pretty rough treatment at times. If we don't want the heat, we'd better stay out of the kitchen. 
Third and last, let's learn from Paul to look ahead and beyond where we currently are. I didn't uh, notice this a few moments ago, but in that final paragraph of the chapter, although Paul is dealing with the false apostles, he's also showing the Corinthians his vision for the future of, of his gospel work. Look at verses 15 and 16, halfway through verse 15. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in somebody else's area. Now, that's a great example of what I was saying a moment ago, of how the Bible serves as our manual to teach us evangelism. Here is Paul having to deal with a very difficult problem which has arisen at Corinth, and he's painstakingly showing the Corinthians how to deal with false teaching and false teachers. But at the same time, he is champing at the bit to enlarge the work and take it into new areas where no work is being presently done. And doesn't that have a lot to say to a congregation like ours? Yes, there's a lot of work to be done here on the ground. Consolidation, teaching, training, building up. But there are lands beyond, to use Paul's phrase in verse 16. There are so many more hearts and souls to be won for Christ. Scotland is almost like virgin territory these days. The gospel has been draining out of the heart and soul of Scotland for three or four generations now. So these chapters are here to train us in gospel work, to train us to think like Paul. Because in learning to think like Paul, we're learning to think more and more like his master. Well, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Dear God, our Father, we thank you for taking this man who was a persecutor and a blasphemer, a violent man, a terrorist, and turning his life right around and fashioning him into a man who was willing to suffer a great deal for the sake of the gospel and the, the sake of his master. We do pray that you will continue to teach us through his example as well as his teaching, that you will help us to love him and to take on board what he says to the Corinthians. And our prayer, dear Father, is that the evangelistic work that we're involved in will be greatly blessed, because without your blessing, we can do nothing. But with your blessing, there will be blessing indeed. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, for our final hymn now, let's take our hymn books and we turn to number 854, 854. Who is on the Lord's side? I love this challenging hymn, these questions that, that it asks us. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the King? Who will be His helpers other lives to bring? 854. <clears throat>
Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.